In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Our dear Lord God and Savior, Jesus Christ, the one who loved us and gave himself for us, I thank you, dear Lord, for bringing us to this new year and bringing us to this very hour and in this very place. With these, your children, that we are gathered here, we come here, dear Lord, desiring you. We come here, dear Lord, seeking you. We come, dear Lord, seeking for you to guide us and direct us and bless us. And I pray, dear Lord, that you would correct us and you would uproot us and you would purify us and sanctify us, allow us to be completely and all for you. Bless this church, bless your words, bless the Sunday school, and bless all the ministries. And we just ask for your mighty presence here right now. The intercession of St. Mary, Archangels Michael and Gabriel, and the witnesses of the Holy Transfiguration, hear us when we, your children, and John the Baptist, hear us when we, your children, cry unto you with one voice, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one, through Christ Jesus our Lord. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. <clears throat> All right, we're still getting set up, but no, this, I mean, it's, it's normal to have a longer, <laughs> okay. We're starting a new series. We are here in 2020. By the grace of God, we made it through 2019. Uh, despite a brain tumor, some radiation, and my daughter turning a teenager, I made it. Thank God. Um, you've probably seen this on billboards all over, 2020 vision. I mean, if you have vision, you can see the sign that says 2020 vision. Uh, the word vision, it's mostly related to what we can see with our physical eyes. And as you know, 2020 is normal vision. What does it mean for someone that has 2030 vision? Meaning that at 20 feet, you could see something that someone with normal vision can see at 30 feet. And if you have 2200 vision, you're on the border of being blind. You are able to see something at 20 feet that someone else can see at 200 feet. But vision is one of the things that I think we take most for granted in our lives. I'm going to give you an example. How many of us didn't get to have coffee yet? How many of us desperately want our coffee? How many of you really want me to finish so you can get your, that's rhetorical, don't answer that one. What if I were to do an experiment? I know how much we love our coffee. But what if I blindfolded you all? The coffee pot's right there, so blindfolded. I want everyone to get up and go get your own coffee blindfolded. It's right there. And you know you desperately want the coffee. I bet a lot of people wouldn't do it, even though you really want it. Why? Oftentimes there's two major consequences. One of them, if we were to do this experiment, many of you would find yourself quickly on the first floor where the coffee is on the second floor. You would not get there walking down the stairs, probably tripping and falling on your head. Many of you might get a severe burn because you're trying to feel for the coffee pot, or you're trying to fill it and you're going to overfill it, or you're going to miss the cup and you're going to burn yourself. One of the consequences of not being able to see is severe injury. But something almost as bad, one of the worst mistakes of going there and putting your cup there is to only fill it halfway 
because you don't know when it's full. You're missing out on the full potential of a full cup of this liquidated, caffeinated, modern version of manna that comes from heaven here on Sundays for you to be able to stay awake during our meeting. There's two major consequences of not having vision. There's disastrous injury oftentimes and oftentimes missing out on something amazing. And actually God tells us this. It's, it's in the Old Testament in Proverbs. He says, where there is no vision, the people perish. And what he's talking about was prophetic vision. When there was no message from God, when there was no ability to see something that could produce hope. When there was no vision, there was no progress. And as you all know, in your own lives, that there are evil forces against us that are trying to prevent our progress. That if you're not moving forward, the most likely result is you're moving backward. And that's why the people perish. In God's eyes, vision for people is a necessity for survival. For drawing close to Him, there has to be vision. I know this is a, an off-the-side story, but in the monkey world, in the jungle... When monkeys are attacking each other, one of the things that they will try to do is blind the other. Because if you are going to be blind, you're going to perish. Vision is critical for our survival in the physical world, but and in the spiritual world. What would you miss out on if you didn't have vision? What are the things that you might miss out on? In Ephesians chapter 1, this is St. Paul's prayer. He says, I also, after I heard your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. So this is his prayer. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, that the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, meaning that you would have vision, the ability to see, but to see what? That you might know what is the hope of his calling, the hope of his calling on earth and in heaven, that you might know what are the riches of the glory of the inheritance of his saints, that you would know what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ Jesus when he raised him from the dead. The hope of his calling, the glory of the riches of his inheritance, and the mighty power that he works towards us, you can only see that if you have vision if God's given you vision that your eyes are enlightened you guys know who Helen Keller is hopefully you know she's a very famous lady she was deaf and had no sight from when she was a child she got an illness she lost her ability to hear and her ability to see I could imagine few things worse than what she had but to her Someone who couldn't physically see and who couldn't hear, she actually became a very successful woman. She got her degree from one of the colleges at Harvard. She became an author of many books. She was a political advocate. She fought for women's rights. She fought for so many things. But this woman who was born with, or who had no ability to see and hear, you want to know what the tragedy was for her? The tragedy for her was if someone had eyes, if they had the ability to see with their eyes, but they didn't have vision. Vision for something more for their life. There's so many people that go through this life without a vision for something greater. This series that we're starting, Vision 2020, is hopefully to let us understand the vision of what we're trying to do at HTC this year and hopefully beyond. I pray that this vision is a tremendous, life-changing vision. From this point on, HTC will go down a path, a glorious path, that involves every individual here, but also individuals out there. That it will involve individuals, but also us as a community. That it will involve your individual families, but us as one family. I pray that God gives us the vision here at HT Suite, HTC 2020, something that will change our trajectory from now until eternity. We're actually desperate for a vision. 
Actually, let me adjust that. We're not desperate for any vision. We're desperate for a great vision. I want to break down what vision really is. There's an author, uh, Bill Hybels, who's written a lot about leadership and vision, and this is his definition. Vision is a picture of the future that produces passion. He didn't say it's just a vision is a picture of the future. A real vision is one that produces passion. And that actually is critical. It's seeing some situation, some people, yourself, your family, your church, your company in the future. But that picture produces something inside of you that makes you want to do something about it. It makes you want to bring it into fruition. If the vision doesn't create emotion... Oftentimes, you have no incentive to implement it. Most visions never get accomplished because there's no true heart-wrenching incentive. Someone might tell you a vision. You might hear a vision. Like, we are going to go clean all the dumpsters in Chino Hills. That's the vision for HTC. We're going to clean everyone's dumpsters. You don't seem that excited. You might say, Mark, that's your vision. Fine, that's yours, but it's not mine. I'm not going to jump in on that vision. A great vision is one where you're excited, where you can't sleep at night. You can't wait. You want to get there, that you want it more than anything. Usually it will address and fix a horrible problem, whether it be in your own life at your workplace, or somewhere in the world. Hopefully it'll create something more beautiful than what is already there. Hopefully it'll change you or someone else for the glory of God. A true vision should be life-changing. So many of the great changes that this world has ever seen have come to fruition because someone had a vision that produced passion. One of those, which it would be a shame to not mention, that we're celebrating tomorrow. It's the Martin Luther King holiday tomorrow because of someone who was born in oppression. He lived a very difficult life as a kid. He suffered many things. But God put a vision on his heart. He gave the vision to him because he knew that he would be obedient He fought against great odds for this vision. He fought against horrible inequalities of this nation that were based on racism. You know the famous speech, he had a dream, he had a vision that one day his children and his grandchildren, his black children, would go to school with white children, they'd be in the playground, they'd be treated equally. They would even have the opportunity to exercise their rights and privileges of being a U.S. citizen. Because of that vision, he fought for it with his life and it cost him his life. But it dramatically changed the United States of America, the greatest country on the planet. That man's vision and pursuing the vision led to change for generations. We are grateful for a man who received the vision but was obedient to the one who gave him the vision. There's lots of visions. You want to know the best vision out there? It's the one that comes from God. It's a God-given vision. We often have our own selfish visions of our dream house, of you know, having a certain position at work. They're oftentimes very materialistic, and they're oftentimes selfish. They're more desires, but they're not the same as a God-given vision. God's visions are always better. This is what he says. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. So if you're going to go after a vision, there's your vision, and there's God's vision. God who sees way beyond us, he sees the reality, and he has the ability to affect the vision. 
What was the greatest vision God ever had? It was you in heaven. You see, the vision started with creating us in his image, even though he knew that we would lose that image. He knew that we would become subject to sin. He knew that we would lose knowledge of him and that we would have no chance in heaven. But his vision went beyond. It was an amazing vision. It wasn't stopped at creating us and perishing, but included a strategic plan. God's vision oftentimes will include a strategic plan. And it satisfied a tremendous problem. When we studied the incarnation last series, it was the divine dilemma. God created us, this all-loving, merciful God. We're his creation, but he couldn't stand to watch us perish. So, he made sure to see the vision through. He provided a perfect Savior through His incarnate Son, who taught us and showed us who God was. He created a path for us to the kingdom. Now, to implement the vision, to implement it, He sent His Son. Jesus Christ accepted to die on the cross in extremely critical parts of the vision. But while He was here, He says, I need a team. I need a team. I'm going to get 12 guys. I'm going to get 12 guys. There's going to be some ladies they're going to help. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to send you guys out to the ends of the earth. You guys are going to change my people. You guys are going to bring them back to me. You're the ones that are going to get to show them who I really am. You're the ones that are going to show them the path from the slavery to sin to the freedom in heaven. God's vision didn't stop at creation. It kept on through salvation. It was an amazing vision, and he had a plan he had a team. And it's pretty amazing. They say about 7 to 8 billion people in the last 20 centuries have believed in Christ. Could you imagine? 7 to 8 billion people? I'd say that's quite a vision. God could see it. Those 12 apostles may not have been able to see it like he did. But his vision is always better. He envisioned the church to make the vision happen. So I'm going to ask you, if the best vision is a godly vision, how do we receive the vision from God? I have to ask you, when was the last time you were seeking one? When was the last time you were looking for a vision from God, for something in your life? Let me show you what God says. God says this in Jeremiah. I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a what? A future and a hope. To me, that's a vision. God says, I know my vision for you. You're going to call upon me. You're going to go and pray to me, and I will listen to you, and you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. When you are seeking me, and my vision with your heart, you're going to receive one. This is the kind of thing where you see the problems in your life, around you at work, in the world. Who has a vision to want to do something about it? When was the last time you said, God, use me. Give me the vision to change the things that I cannot stand to see anymore. God created you specifically, uniquely, individually different than every single one in this room and on the planet because he has the vision for you already. He knows what he wants you to accomplish. But the question is, do you want it? Will you take it? Who's going to take the vision he has for you? Do you have a vision for the homeless people, for the persecuted Christians, for the millions of refugees that are suffering, for those who are starving, who don't have clean water, for the sex traffic, for those who don't have access to medical. I can go on and on and on. God has so much vision. For every single person, there is a vision, and probably more than one. How many of you want a vision for your family? Sometimes we go through times where a situation, when you look at your family and it brings you to tears. You say, when I got married, 
this, this really wasn't what I wanted. You want a family that's strong as a unit, that submits to the will of God, that when he calls that your family will obey to advance his kingdom. Do you want a vision for your marriage? When was the last time you said, God, give me a vision for my marriage? Sometimes the passion and the interest is waning. Sometimes there's a great distance between you and your spouse. Maybe the vision he wants to give you isn't only for your family. Maybe his vision is because you've been through a difficulty in your family that he wants you to help the other families. Who wants a vision for your church, for your nation, for your company, for your neighborhood? Who wants a vision? God gives a vision to those who seek him and to those who are praying for them and who are willing to obey them. Imagine if St. Mark was not willing to be obedient to the vision to go to North Africa and bring the word to them. Where would we be? Imagine if St. Thomas didn't go to India. Imagine if St. Athanasius, when he was a kid and he was trying to enact being the Pope and baptizing the others, if you know his story, what if he didn't have the vision when they told him the whole church is against you, the whole world is against you, and he said... God told me and I'm going to be against the world and I'm going to win. What if they didn't obey the vision? Where would we be? Those who obeyed the vision are the ones who have changed the world. There are so many visions given. The sad thing is Many times the people are not willing to obey God to fulfill the vision. I'll never know what those visions were because they didn't go pursue them. You have to seek a vision, you have to pray for a vision, and you have to obey it when you know that it came from God. If God says you wanted a vision, here's the vision I'm putting in your heart. No, no, it might be hard. Oftentimes, in order to see the vision clearly, we have to get rid of certain distractions in our life. We all get very busy. Uh, there's lots of things that kind of take us away from, from God. Sometimes we have to clean up certain sins in our life. And oftentimes what is required for you to receive the vision is for you to align your heart with God's heart. There's a man named Robert Pierce. Um, he had this prayer, God, break my heart for the things that break yours. He was in China in the 50s, and uh, he was presented with an abandoned child. And he says, I'll do what I can. He had $5 in his pocket. He says, I'll give the $5. But he says, it's not enough. I cannot just let these children go. And I, I have to do more. And so he had the vision, and he started this organization called World Vision International. One of the, it actually is the largest Christian non governmental international organization in the whole world serving 100 countries. It's an incredible organization, but because of one man who had a passion, who wanted his heart aligned with God's heart, he says, God, show me what you want me to do. And God says, I want you to serve the whole world. His vision became what? What is the name of it? World vision. Unbelievable. One man and now serves hundreds. His organization, not him, he passed away, has served hundreds of millions of people because one man obeyed a vision. He was aligned with God's will. He prayed. He yielded himself. He did amazing things with what God gave him. You have to seek the vision, pray for the vision, yield to the vision, but something that is critical is you have to own the vision. You can't just say, wow, that's a cool vision. I think it's great. Somebody will do it. But who's going to own it? That when you have the vision, when God gives it to you, there are people that you hear other visions and you're like, we're never owning it. We're not willing to have a stake in the game. We're not willing to take a risk. We're not willing to be inconvenienced. We're not, many of us 
may not get to accomplish something of great significance because you won't take responsibility for the vision. Commit your prayers, your time, your energy, your resources. It's when God puts it on your heart, He's going to want you to be all in. You know what all in means? It's this mentality of, I'm going to go down with the ship. Meaning, God gave me this vision. I'm going to fight for this vision until the vision happens or I can't fight anymore. But I'm not going to go out of this world without fighting for the vision. When was the last time you owned the vision that God gave you? So, yeah, that's a great vision. It's somebody else's vision. And in the church, when the church has a vision, it's not going to fall only on the shoulders of the two priests. They're going to need a champion for each of the aspects of the vision. Who's going to step up in our church? Who's going to be the champion for the service for the couples, for the new parents, for the grieving families, for the children, for the foreign missions, for kids with disabilities, for whatever? Who's going to be the champion in our church for the visions under the big vision? It has to be you. Will you be a champion for the vision? Pray that God will put the vision on your heart. Many are going to say, well, how do I know that I received it? Well, it might be the vision of some organization. It might be because someone in your life who has some influence on you has a vision and you've seen that vision and you feel that God is leading you towards it. It might be some burning in your heart. It might be from a book that you read, such as the Bible, or a book about poverty. It might be a place you've traveled, whether it be to another country or some poor area here. Or it might be a story you heard of transformation. Oftentimes, the vision is related to a need that you see and a problem that you want satisfied. Your heart will ache. And you will know that it's from God when it's beyond you. It honors Him and it advances His kingdom. It's beyond you. It's bigger than you. Does God have a vision for you as an individual? He does. But He wants you to be a different individual, maybe a better individual, so that you can serve others to glorify God and to advance His kingdom. Seek it, pray for it, yield to it, own it, be a champion for it, and then plan for it. Most of the time, we have goals and resolutions and they fail because there's no strategic planning. We say in the beginning of the year, I want to be more spiritual. What on earth does that mean? It's not clear. You have no idea. What does it mean to be more spiritual? You haven't provided a way for you to measure. At the end of the year, can you tell if you're more spiritual? I don't know. Is it a clearly stated, specific goal that can be measured over a specific time period? There's accountability where someone can, either for you, there's parts in the vision where it's like, okay, we're making progress towards the vision, and maybe you need a mentor. There's a Stanford professor, he wrote some great books, and he says sometimes when a vision comes up, you need to have a BHAG, B-H-A-G, big, hairy, audacious goals, meaning something bigger than you can do on your own, where it's such a big vision that I cannot do this without the grace and support of God and possibly other people. The vision can't be, well, my vision is we're going to put all the chairs together after coffee. Now, that is a big, big vision. I know that this place will be, I mean, that's big. We will need to pray for that. Sometimes it's bigger than that. So big that you will be on your knees. Your heart is breaking because you want the vision to happen, but you can't do it on your own. So what do you do? You pray. You cry. You seek. You fight. You reach. You do whatever you can so that the vision is done. God's vision will come 
And you will know because there's a burning in your heart. The sad reality is that for many of us, beyond a certain stage in our life, maybe after college or graduate school, maybe after getting married, vision disappears from our lives. In so many areas of our lives, we lack a vision. But one of the best visions I've ever seen in the Bible was the one where Ezekiel is led to a valley. He sees a valley of dried, dead bones. Most of us see the valley of dry, dead bones. And he says, O son of man, can these have life? And what happens? They became alive. They were strengthened. The bones were put together. Flesh was wrapped around the bones. They were given the spirit of God. They became an army for God. Many of us see dead bones and we walk away. But God wants you to see that with his eyes, with his vision, with his clarity, you can see the dead bones become alive. Where in your life is there a need for a vision? Is it your own spiritual life where all you see are dead bones? Is it in your marriage that has kind of lost its luster? Is it for the needy people all around the world? Is it bigger than you? It's not too big for God. I'm praying that in this year, God will give us an amazing vision for this church, for every individual, for every family, and for the world at large. Pray this week. Open your hearts. Be aligned with his will. Pray for a vision. May God be glorified in our lives now and forever. Amen. Let's stand up and pray. <clears throat> In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Our dear, glorious God, who has a great mind, who has great thoughts, who has great vision, who has great understanding, who has great plans, who has great hope for each and every one of us, I thank you that we can come to you and we can say, dear God, there's so much dryness in my life and I want it to be different. I want a change. And I pray, dear Lord, for everyone standing here before you, that you would lay a heavy burden on our hearts, not just for us. We want to please you. What is it in this world that you want this small group to do for your glory and for your kingdom? I pray that you send a mighty and a clear vision that will go near and far, that lives will be transformed. I pray, dear Lord, that you grant us your spirit to open our eyes, give us vision, give us understanding. Help us, O Lord, to fall on our knees, to humble ourselves, to submit ourselves, to think beyond ourselves, to lay down our lives for you, just as you had the vision to do for us. I know we may not be able to see the end of the vision. I pray, dear Lord, you help us to see the beginning of it. I pray for your mercy. I pray for your forgiveness. I pray for clean hearts. Create in us clean hearts, hearts with passion, hearts with vision, hearts with love. I thank you for your great mercy and this church where we receive your vision and your blessing. Hear us when we, your children, united as one heart with one voice, lift up our hands, cry unto you through the session of St. Mary, and all your saints, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one through Christ Jesus our Lord. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.